I also welcome Madam Sonata Tripathi, the host of the webinar and the secretary of the forum. And with this, I once again offer my welcome to all the peers, all the scholars of philosophy and other disciplines to be part of this uh, virtual academic platform. Then over to Professor Das to commence his speech. Over to Professor Das. Am I audible, sir? It's audible. Audible. Respected uh, Dr. Maharan, sir, very esteemed participants of this session. Today we have a very beautiful topic intellectuality, morality, and spirituality. <clears throat> Descartes, Spinoza, Leibniz. Because we are going to uh, start with the philosophy of Leibniz after discussing both Rand, um, Bacon, Descartes, and Spinoza. So, I thought that uh, this topic is relevant for the discussion of the philosophy of life. Descartes focused on intellectuality. We shall discuss how Spinoza ended his philosophy with morality and how the philosophy of life means is spiritualistic by nature. These three, the intellectual possibility, the moral possibility, and the spiritual possibilities are human possibilities. These are the dynamic sources of human knowing. Intellectuality is given priority in the philosophy of Alan Descartes. Descartes started his philosophy by doubting everything because Descartes wanted to start his philosophy de novo. And this is the uh, interest of all rationalist philosophers to think rationally without any bias, without any dogmatic assumption without any speculation. So we shall speak something, even we shall speak about metaphysics without speculation. So it is generally believed that philosophy is speculative by nature. So Descartes, Spinoza and Leibniz, they tried to solve this problem. They tried to prove that philosophy is not speculative by nature. Philosophy is true like mathematics, like geometry. As mathematics is true, so is philosophy. So, then the second problem is, if we shall compare mathematics with philosophy, then the question will come, then the problem will come, is philosophy just formal, like mathematics? The answer is no. These philosophers, Descartes, Spinoza, and Leibniz, though they deal with mathematics and geometry, they, they have tried to explain the phenomenal world through mathematics and geometry. It is not that we are discussing mathematics for the sake of mathematics. It is not the case that we are discussing about analytic statements which speak nothing. Even it is not the case that we are talking about uh, inductive process which concludes nothing because in induction there is no conclusion because the conclusion is relative or probable. And when we speak of analytic proposition that speaks nothing because the predicate repeats the subject. So philosophy is not like this. So, the um, beauty of Descartes' philosophy, as we, we, are, we, we have discussed, 
that is his methodology that he applied a method what is that method the method is to find to discover the truth as self evident self evident means which is evident by itself which does not need any other instrument any other format any other principle to be evident and if philosophy will start from such self evident principles then we can have a proper deduction we can deduce the further principles theories through the from the first principle therefore philosophy of descartes and spinoza they are based upon principles there are certain fundamental principles so intellectual exercise is the hallmark of cartesian philosophy that if we claim that we are rational if man claims that man is a rational animal man should be free from any type type of a bias any type of a dogmatic approach so let us reject everything let us challenge everything let us question everything let us doubt everything because if we shall prove anything we shall prove it in the proper process there are two types of a philosophical starting one is the one starting is from the speculative that is the speculative assumptions and the other is from zero from zero means nothing is accepted nothing is accepted we shall we shall start our philosophy from zero so um, in in um, um, philosophy of john locke john locke also said that mind is a tabula rasa nothing is printed in mind so every knowledge is acquired by mind through experience in the philosophy of descartes descartes does not believe in experience in the first hand descartes says that if i have a mind and my, that mind is rational then we can have the self evident truths through our intellectual exercise so let us doubt everything what can be doubted let us doubt everything what can be doubted so in that process dekar reached at a point that there is something which cannot be doubted that means there is no hindrance of doubting there is no problem of doubting but there is something which cannot be doubted without committing self contradiction if if you see the situation that can be accepted as self evident what is that Now, that i can't doubt that i doubt if i doubt that i doubt then my doubting will stand that, that, that my doubting will not stand that means the very act of doubting cannot be doubted this is self evident there is nothing to prove it no empirical science is required to prove it no mathematics is required to prove it this is self evident no it is universal self evident means it is universal it is accepted by all at all place and at all time so it is picked up a space time and person self evident truths are eternal truths so i cannot doubt that i doubt that means the very act of doubting is certain if that is the act of doubting then that is the act of thinking if that is the act of thinking there must be a thinker and i am that thinker so kachito ergo sum i think therefore i am 
this is not a deductive conclusion and this is not a deductive process. I think is the premise and I am is the conclusion. No. I think therefore I am, this is the self-evident proposition or the self-evident truth which cannot be doubted at all. If we have to find not only this principle, Descartes formulated so many principles, so many principles out of that he developed his philosophy. So we can, that means this empirical world can be doubted. No epistemology can prove the certainty of the empirical world. Doubted means what can be possibly doubted. If there is a possibility of doubting, that cannot be accepted. Doubt means the possible doubt. That may not be the actual doubt. If there is a possibility of a doubt, then that cannot be accepted. Many things are there. They are beyond our reach. They are beyond our experience. So we don't have any access to doubt that. But if it is logically doubted, may not be empirically doubted, if it is logically doubted, then that cannot be accepted. But there are certain principles which cannot be empirically doubted, even not logically doubted, logically rejected. That is, I think, therefore I am. My existence is implied from my thinking. If thinking, if thinking activity is there, then the substance must be there. Another principle that Descartes claims that no substance without attributes or no attributes without substance. Attributes are there means there must be a substance. The principle is no non-existent thing, no non-existent thing can have attributes. If this, the substance, if you say that the substance is non-existent, then we can't say that 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 must have attributes. Attributes are there, but substance is not there. This is another dogmatic assumption. There are two things. Many philosophers claim, implicit philosophers claim, that your assumption about substance is dogmatic because. Substance is not perceived. So they take epistemology as the standard of proving the existence of substance. Because the existence, existence of substance is not accessible through our epistemology, therefore that does not exist. That means the existence of something is conditional to our epistemological process. To be is to be perceived. To exist is to be perceived. That means existence can be claimed by our perception. If something is not perceived, if something is not perceivable, that cannot exist. But Locke said, Locke said, Locke is an implicit. But Locke said, we may not perceive the substance, but, but we can logically infer the existence of substance from the attributes. Because there are attributes, there must be a substance and that, that is a logical inference, because though we don't actually perceive it. Therefore, he said, I know not to heart. I know that there is a substance of which these are the attributes, but I know not what. What is the nature of that substance? What is the um, uh, function of that substance? About that I am silent. About that I am ignorant. Buddha also said that. Gautam Buddha said that I am silent about metaphysics. Whether there is a soul as substance, whether there is a matter as substance, I am silent about it because they do not come in the purview of 
our material experience, our empirical experience. Whatever is perceived, whatever is experienced, that can be claimed to exist. So, impressionist philosophers say that the claim of rationalist philosophers about the existence of substance is a dogmatic assumption. Similarly, rationalist philosophers claim that your assumption that there can be attributes without substance, this is also a dogmatic assumption. How can there be attributes without the substance? How can there be effect without cause? If you say that, then this is also a dogmatic assumption. Therefore, Immanuel Kant tried to reconcile both empiricism and rationalism, but he also failed. He also said, by the best use of rationalism and empiricism, we can know only the phenomenal world. Suppose we take both the instruments, the best use of rationality, the best use of um, 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 empiricism, we shall take both sense experience and reason, still we can know only the phenomenal world, the world in itself or the noumena will remain unknown and unable forever. Therefore, science is probable. Therefore, philosophy is speculative. Therefore, religion is just a belief. Because these are all created by human intelligence. So, in Vedanta it is said, whatever man tries to describe, when man tries to describe the indescribable, it is a false attempt. Spinoza also said that if you try to determine the indeterminate, if you try to determine the indeterminate, the indeterminate will become determinate. That means the more you determine, the more you limit it. All determinism is the negation. Because you, human being, being having a finite mind, you cannot define, you cannot describe the infinite. You cannot define the totality. You cannot define the substance. So both rationalist and implicit philosophers somehow or other admit the finite aspect of human mind. Spinoza says that the human mind is so finite that it can grasp only two attributes. Substance has infinite attributes, but human mind can grasp only two attributes, thought and existence, mind and body. Because that is the human format. Man cannot transcend human format. So man, whatever man perceives, Whatever man conceives, man has to perceive and conceive through the human format. And that human format is extension and thought, body and mind, according to Spinoza. Similarly, Immanuel Kant said, human knowledge is through human format, that is space and time that regulate our perception and 12 categories of understanding that, that is the form of our understanding and these are all human formats. Beyond that, man has no access. Human epistemology ends there. Human epistemology cannot explain the metaphysics. So epistemology, any epistemology can't explain the metaphysics. Another thing we shall discuss. Is there any really metaphysics? Metaphysics is a misnomer in this sense. Metaphysics is metaphysics till it is known, till, till uh, we know it. 
when the metaphysics is known, it becomes physics. Sometimes, uh, there was a time we don't have a mobile phone, so that was metaphysics for us. Now that is very much physics, that is available to us, that is, we, we can avail it. So, the area of ignorance, the area of ignorance is metaphysics, but that area of ignorance becomes the area of knowledge through the development of science. So, metaphysics becomes physics in the course of her time. But, the island of our knowledge is surrounded by the vast ocean of ignorance. The area of ignorance is so vast that the human mind with science, philosophy, religion, literature, technology, with everything, human mind, human epistemology can't reach that metaphysics. So there is naturally a gap between metaphysics and physics. So both rationalist philosophers and implicit philosophers have admitted the limit of human mind. Descartes said, mind is a relative substance. In that way, Descartes said that mind is finite. Spinoza said, human mind can grasp only two attributes of the substance. Substance has infinite attributes. That means human mind cannot grasp the total manifestation of the infinite substance. What is this world? This world of modification is only the manifestation or modification of that known two attributes. That means this world where we live in is only a possible world. It is one possibility out of infinite possibilities. The manifested world, the world of modification, the world of diversity, the world of multiplicity is only a possible world. It is a possible world of two attributes only. That means substance has other attributes and those other attributes have other modifications. That means there are infinite numbers of worlds out of which human mind can grasp only two attributes and their modifications. So, so Spinoza tried to solve the problem of Descartes, Descartes dualism by advocating abstract monism and pantheism. Spinoza said that substances cannot be two. As per the definition, if we shall go, if we shall see the definition of substance, which is self-existent and self-conceived, which does not depend upon anything for its existence and for its conception, if this is the definition of substance, there cannot be step in of substance. There cannot be a second substance. There cannot be a subsidiary substance. This, 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 this stands contradictory to the definition of substance. So substance must be one. Satyam abadhitam. This is said in Upanishad. Satya must be one. Satya, satyam abadhitam. That means Truth cannot be contradicted by any substitute. Even the subject cannot be con cannot be con cannot be predicated. That so that can't be any predicate as the second entity to the sub subject. The subject and the predicate they are identical. Aham Brahmasmi. I am that Brahma. You are that Brahma. This entire world is Brahma, Sarva Khavidam Brahma. So if we claim a second entity, then that will lead to dualism. On this ground, Sinoda said, by definition, substance cannot be two, substance cannot be many, 
substance is one. Then what is about this world of multiplicity? This world of multiplicity is the modification of that one substance. But here comes two questions. If this world is the modification of that one substance, then what is the status of the world? Whether Jagat Mithya or Jagat Satya, Sankara said, Brahma Satya, Jagat Mithya, Ramanuja said, Brahma Satya, Jagat Satya. Then what is the view of Spinoza? Whether Jagat is Mithya or Satya? Spinoza said, Jagat is both Mithya and Satya. Jagat is Satya in the sense, the attributes and modes are nothing but the manifestation of the same substance and there cannot be, there cannot be a second reality, second reality to the substance because it will lead to dualism. So modes cannot be finite, modes cannot be unreal because an unreal reality cannot stand opposite to the one substance because that will lead to dualism. So everything is one. So one, the unmanifest, each man, this is the state of unmanifest, that is one, undeterminate, which cannot be determined, indescribable, achintya, which cannot be thought of, and this world is the manifestation, a possible manifestation, a partial manifestation of that one. I am giving an example. Suppose, um, suppose I am suffering from fever. So my blood needs, needs to be tested. Should I give the entire blood of my body or should I give one drop of blood? I shall give a drop of blood because the doctor knows, the medical science knows, forget about metaphysics. The physical science knows that the essence of the one drop of blood is equal to the entire quantity of the blood of my body. Similarly, each and every mode is equal in essence with that ultimate substance. Spinoza borrowed this thought from geometry. Spinoza said that I shall not speak about philosophy, I shall speak about geometry. In geometry there is a there is there is there, there is there is education of um, eternity as we say that there is infinite space, there is infinite space, and of that infinite space the triangle is a form, the circle is a form, the square is a form. And be it a big triangle or a small triangle, be it a very small triangle or a big triangle, there is the same principle of eternity. The, the, uh, the principle is same in all the forms of triangle, that is the sum total of angles is equal to two right angles. Spinoza discovered this from geometry that be it a big triangle, be it the biggest triangle occupying the, occupying the entire space and be it a very small triangle, this principle is same. That the sum total of three angles is equal to two right angles. Similarly, the essence of each and every mode is the same essence that we find in some, that is in the substance, that is in the, that infinite substance. Then in, so the modes are real, attributes are real and substance is real because they can't be unreal. Because if they will remain unreal, that will lead to dualism. Something is real, something is unreal. In that sense, and monism cannot be established. 
But at the same time, Spinoza say the modes are unreal. Why modes are unreal? From the metaphysical point of view, the substance, attributes and modes all are real. But from the epistemological point of view, as human mind is limited, finite, as human mind can grasp only the, pra only the part, not the total manifestation, as human mind, human intellect can grasp only two attributes and their modifications, so grasping the part, man cannot conclude the whole. So from the epistemological point of view, the modes are unreal. From the metaphysical point of view, the modes are real. So in this way, Descartes and Spinoza tried to speak of two types of reality. One is abstract monism and the other is pantheism. So far as pantheism is concerned, everything is real. So far as abstract monism is concerned, the Jagat is Mithya. Jagat is Mithya when we speak of abstract monism. So this is the state of wisdom. From the, in the state of wisdom, we can say Brahma Satya, Jagat Mithya. But in the Vebaharika Satya, when we live in this empirical world, we have to encounter with this world of diversities. In that Vebaharika Satya, we have to accept this world as real. That is the epistemological perspective. Because our, because our knowledge is limited, we have to manage with that limited knowledge. We have to live with, live in this relative world. We know everything is relative, everything is subject to change. We experience change, but we have to live through that change. But by wisdom we know, beyond this change, there is the infinite substance, there is one. This knowledge is a human possibility. The beauty of rationalist philosophy is that Descartes and Spinoza, Descartes derived his philosophy from mathematics and Spinoza derived his philosophy from geometry in a very beautiful way. Then what is about intellectuality and morality? Descartes became the father of modern European, modern philosophy. His contribution was the methodology. His contribution was that we should start philosophy, philosophical inquiry with a clean mind, clear and distinct perception that which cannot be challenged. The, for this methodology, Descartes became famous. So his starting point was very good. That, that, that there is no liability, there is no responsibility. Reject everything. Become zero. And from that zero, Descartes tried to become a hero. And he became a hero also. He doubted everything. So he started his philosophy from zero. But he said that there is one thing that cannot be doubted and from that self-evident truth, he established the entire truth. That I think, I exist, if I exist, then God exists, if God exists, then world exists. So he proved the existence of self, God, world, from that self-evident truth, that I can't doubt that I doubt. The very act of doubting can't be doubted. This is deduction. So Descartes followed the path of deduction, the process of deduction. Spinoza followed the path of involution. Spinoza started his philosophy from the definition of substance. That substance, if that substance is understood, if that unity is understood, then we can understand the status of diversity. So Spinoza, Spino Spinozistic philosophy is the philosophy of involution, pantheism. 
that that substance is one high substance is one because by definition substance cannot be true or many by definition substance cannot be true or many so substance is bound to be one and if that substance is one then the 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 world of diversity that is also the same as that one ultimate substance in that way spinoza tried to solve the problem of a um dualism double dualism the dualism of metaphysics and physics and the dualism of mind and body the interaction theory but what is about intellectuality decart's philosophy started with intellectuality intellectuality means decart um, decart's methodology the universal doubt he said that we should start philosophy with mathematics that means we should have a very logical mind logic is the logic is the base reason is the base and with that logic with that deduction with that intuition we can we can deduce all possible truths so by that way decker focused on the intellectual side of man that man is a man is an intellectual being and this is also true man should be rational man should not be irrational but this is not the ultimate goal of life only being rational only being intellectual only being intelligent is not our complete personality man is not only rational man should be moral man should have a moral consciousness man should have man should live with values because morality is a human possibility animals do not animals animals don't understand what is moral and what is immoral they do according to their instincts they do according to the laws of nature they do according to their passions but human beings can do something otherwise human human beings can can uh, revise can rethink can can human 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 intellect is critical by nature man can criticize man can ask question man can ask the question of good and bad right and wrong that is called discriminative knowledge in sankhya philosophy it is said that the highest knowledge is the knowledge of discrimination that the purusha and the prakriti are different that my this this the world of appearance the the empirical world and the transcendental world are different reality and unreality are different good and bad are different so this discriminative knowledge is the right knowledge and that is rationality but only this qualification is not our complete personality doctors are rational very rational very intelligent but the most intelligent doctor is capable of stealing kidney an ordinary doctor can steal kidney can can sell the um, our um, um, organic parts the skilled doctor who is very much intelligent who is very much rational he can steal kidney so rationality and morality they are not same thing one is rational that does not mean he must be moral why because rationality or reason does not deal with truth and falsity reason deals with validity and invalidity that means reason is formal if we if we have the privileged access of rationality 
by applying that rationality by applying that reason we can make false as true or truth as false for example in the court of law two advocates are uh, are trying a case suppose in a murder case the accused may may be may be relieved of his of his charges only by the arguments that means if reason satisfies the validity of an argument then whatever may be the fact it may be true or may be false that does not matter so all the propositions may be false but the argument may be valid this is the consequence of a reason so that means reason is a rational reason is an intellectual entertainment so by reason man can man can prove um his actions he can justify his actions so man suffers from his own justification if i am doing something wrong if i could justify that by applying reason then it is accepted that means that means um, um reason can reason can ability but that reason should not be misused if we misuse our reason to establish a false thing to establish a wrong thing then that is the misuse of reason and that misuse of reason is an evil that is not virtue who are the real uh, real uh, wicked person or rascals or criminals highly rational people are terrorists terrorists are not uneducated people they are very much rational they have reasons for being a terrorist they have reasons suppose we are ask a terrorist why you are a terrorist he have a hundred reasons that for these reasons i have become a terrorist suppose a husband and wife they quarrel and they going to they 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 they, they, they filed a case of the divorce case wife has a hundred reasons against husband and the husband has a hundred one reasons against wife and both the um, reasons are justified from their perspectives so reason is not a complete personality the rationality is not the total qualification of man but decades decade decade has that contribution that decade made man rational decade made man intellectual man became intellectually sound because we should not have any dogmatic assumption we should not have any philosophy should not have any dogmatic assumption philosophy should be free from dogma so this is not a small contribution but this is not enough this is not enough philosophy is not only an um, uh, not only uh, analytic by nature that it is so simply analyze the meaning of propositions analytic philosophy is not a total philosophy philosophy deals with morality human personality will be become a com- will become a complete personality purnanga vyaktitva the complete personality if man is groomed with culture with intellectuality morality and spirituality so spinoza developed the morality the moral possibility in man spinoza said moral principles should be like geometrical principles as in all forms of triangle may be it a big triangle or a small triangle the same law operates that the sum total of three angles is equal to two right angles 
similarly our moral behavior our morality should not be compromised it is just like categorical imperative of immanuel kant as immanuel kant said that moral law is categorical imperative categorical means unconditional that means under any condition you can compromise with your morality as triangle does not compromise be it a small triangle it holds its dharma triangle holds its dharma be it a small triangle or big triangle so should be our moral commitment man should not be contextual by nature man should be categorical by nature that means our action our morality should be self determined should be self determined our substance is self determined our substance is indeterminate as similarly the moral character should be self determined that means no society can determine the value no individual can determine the value no state can determine the value no place can determine the value no context can determine the value as a triangle is a triangle irrespective of all differences morality is morality irrespective of all contextuality moral character should be like mathematics and geometry this is said by spinoza and this is also said by immanuel kant this should be moral character but bhagavad gita we see to self just i am taking you know, two or three sentences bhagavad gita is antithetical to categorical imperative bhagavad gita says if you this is the limitation of spinoza also this is the limitation of immanuel kant if you say that moral principle is a categorical imperative that man is impractical that man is not a practical man that complete personality is not helpful for the society because the man lives in this empirical world and in this empirical world facts are changing things are changing customs are changing everything is changing here we are living in a changing world we are living in a relative world we are living in an empirical world an empirical world is contextual by nature therefore bhagavad gita said so dharma so dharma means my dharma in a particular context i know dharma i know categorical imperative that this should be that suppose dharma or the traffic rule is that i should go in the left side suppose there is a bus on the left side should i dash with the bus or should i will you stick to the right uh, right side so in a particular context we have to change our behavior if we do not know how to change our behavior how to adjust with the um, 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 with the situation then the, that man is not a practical man as intellectuality does not lead to morality similarly morality does not lead to practical aspect of human being if a morality is formal then that is useless it has no so this is the limit of uh, the rationalistic approach of a moral principle yes it is a good thing that we should be unconditional as immanuel kant said don't use don't don't um, take don't use anybody as means work in the kingdom of ends that you are an end in yourself you are an end and don't use anybody as the means and don't use yourself as the means use yourself as end and use others as end if you behave like this 
then you shall live in the world of aims, kingdom of aims. So this is an idealistic approach of morality. This is not practically sound. Therefore, the concept of Sadharma is introduced in Bhagavad Gita. Therefore, the, 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 in the modern time, we are discussing about practical ethics. Practical ethics speaks about contextuality. No, man, man, morality is contextual. The context will decide, the context will decide which, which um, action is right or which action is wrong. That means one absolute moral principle cannot be applied in every situation. Spinogistic, monism or pantheism that is beautiful in metaphysics, but that cannot be applied in moral, morality. Here comes a question. Those who believe in uh, ecologism or rationalism or strict principle of morality, they will, they will hesitate to accept the contextuality. Now, how can they become contextual at the cost of the cardinal values, at the cost of the fundamental principles? Bhagavad Gita says, no, these two possibilities are, are um, these two possibilities can be maintained. That dharma and sudharma, that means the indeterminate, indeterminate moral order and the determinate moral order, both can be maintained in human life. How? When you are doing sudharma, when you are acting in a particular context, when you are you are facing a particular situation, you are doing your sadharma, you are not free from that dharma. That means when you are taking one drop of your blood, that also carries the essence of the entire quantity of your blood. The drop of ocean carries the same essence of the past ocean. Similarly, in your sadharma, you are not devoid of the, the ultimate dharma. So dharma consciousness is there, but its application is different. How to apply it? For example, driving. The, um, when we are, we are getting training, um, we, are, we are taking um, driving training from the uh, trainer, we are trained. We are trained about driving, we know all the driving skills, that is dharma. That is dharma, that we know. But the moment we drive our car on the road, that there we face the context. There the trainer can help us. We have to face the situation. What is the situation before me? By that I can drive my car. But that does not mean I have forgotten the driving train. That does not mean I have forgotten the, tra forgotten the traffic rule. So dharma and so dharma, they go side by side. So Bhagavad Gita has synthesized these two Vadharma, that means categorical imperative and contextual imperative. Both are possible. In that way, man can be a complete personality. So Spinoza applied his abstract monism and pantheism in morality. First, Spinoza applied the geometrical knowledge to philosophy. How? From the infinite space, triangle is a form, triangle is a form, and triangle is a modification, and the essence of that modification is equal to the infinite space. 
so is the relation between substance attributes and modes and so is the relation of man and moral acts that man should be man should have a strong moral commitment but this is a guest contextualism if anything is lacking in our personality you cannot be called a spiritual person spirituality transcends both transcends both intellectuality and morality spirituality is not exclusive of intellectuality and morality philosophy is all a sorry spirituality it's all inclusive that means spirituality includes intellectuality and morality intellectuality means the proper use of intellect if you misuse your intellect you are not a spiritual person if you if you are not practical in your moral in your in your in, your, in morality then you are not a complete person or you are not spiritual in spirituality there is no question of misuse no misuse of intellect no misuse of morality that means intellect intellectual ability should be used properly and the moral consciousness should be practical if if we fulfill these conditions then we can we can be said that man is a spiritual being man 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 can be defined in many ways number one man is an animal nobody can deny that yes i am an animal because i have instinct i have appetite i have hunger anger sex fear everything i i have perception animals also perceive so i have many common qualities that animals have so i am an animal second possibility i am a rational animal third possibility i am a moral rational animal and the fourth possibility i am a spiritual moral rational animal that means my highest personality is my spirituality if i am spiritual 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 means we should not think that it is speculative or it is something something transcendental no the definition of spiritual means purna purna full full complete the complete manifestation of your personality there is no ignorance there is no limitation so man should be spiritual by nature life means philosophy contributes that life means rejected becomes dualism life means rejected becomes monism life means said that every every entity is is real and every entity is conscious every entity has a force where how can we um, understand this as the contextualism said that every context has a value in every context we can we can um, execute the moral principles and we, the context will determine whether our action is moral or immoral for example telling lie telling truth is a virtue telling truth is a virtue that's that's all right categorical importing will say immanuel kant will say spinoza will say telling truth is virtue means under any condition you can't tell a lie contextualism will say no telling truth is virtue but under this and that under these conditions you can tell lie taking life is violence you can't murder anybody but in the battlefield you can kill a person 
So the context determines whether your action is good or bad. The context, the context of the battlefield and the context of the marketplace. The, the action is the same, killing a person. Here in the marketplace, killing a person is treated as a murder. In the battlefield, killing a person is invaded. Is digging fight. Is giving credit that you did your duty as a Sodharma. In the battlefield, O oh Arjuna, you are a Khetriya, you are a fighter, and this is the battlefield, your duty is to fight. Your context says you should fight. But if you are going to marketplace, in the marketplace, the context has been changed, so your duty has been changed. Bradley says, my station, my duty. My station will determine what is my duty. That means every context is important. Every context is important. That means my commit, my commi commitment like Vishma Pratigya is a, is a misconception. One should not have Vishma Pratigya. Whatever may happen, I have this promise means I shall fulfill it. No, this is nonsense. You can't have Vishma Pratigya. You should have, if you are really rational, you have to adjust yourself, you have to live with the context. What is the context? If my promise is having any bad effect for the society, I should change my promise. I should change my thought. So to, to change with the change of the situation is the real aspect. And that determines our morality. So now, likeness, monarchy is that. That every, as every context is real, every atom is real. Similarly, every entity is real and that entity is called the monarch. That means substances are many. Substance is not one, substance are not two, substances are many. Infinite numbers of substances are there. That means this world is not the modification of that one substance. And this world is not the relative substance like Descartes. It is neither relative substance like Descartes, it is, nor it is the modification of that one substance. Rather, each and every part of this world is a substance. It has substance and status. This leads to spirituality and that is consciousness. Every entity has a conscious force and that entity is indivisible by nature. Indivisible. If there is a division, it is not real. It can be substance. Substance is indivisible. That indivisible entity is substance. And there are infinite numbers of substances, infinite numbers of substances, and they are organized, they are harmonized. So there is harmony, there is harmony in every substance, in every monarch. There is a beautiful harmony. So life that speaks about to ontological, ontological um, 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 metaphysics that there is a purpose, there is a plan, there is a design. This world is not chaotic by nature. Human life has a direction. Human life is a direction. Similarly, this 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 this, this, this phenomenal world is a cosmos. Cosmos means it has an order. In Upanishad it is called Rita. Rita means a cosmic order. There is a causal order. Every cause has its own effect. Everything is disciplined here. Everything is backed by your design. Everything is coordinated. Everything is harmonized. And this harmony is maintained by God. Is maintained by God. 
when we speak of a girl, we shall remain silent, but at least we can understand that there is harmony, there is coordination, there is that everything is well organized. Leibniz said it is pre-established harmony. Two things, every part is real. Second, every part is integrated, coordinated. Every part is coordinated. Similarly, human personality, the every aspect of human personality should be coordinated, should be integrated. I have seen, we experience many people, they are very gentle in public, but they are very rude in their own family. Very rude, but very gentle in public. That means they have double personality. That is not the nature of monarchy. That is not the nature of morality. Completeness, well coordination, well harmony. So I shall I shall speak details about Leibniz in the next session. Just I am concluding with two or three sentences. Human personality should be complete. If the human personality is not complete, man cannot be called rational. Leibniz is called a true rationalist because Leibniz speaks of the spiritual possibility of human personality. Descartes spoke of one possibility that is intellectuality. Spinoza highlighted morality, but Spinoza's morality is like Immanuel Kant's morality that become that became categorical, formal, rigorous, impractical. And Descartes' intellectual started with intellectual and ended with intellectual. So these two proved the inadequacy of human personality. So intellectuality should be properly used. Morality should be practical. That is possible if each and every aspect of human life is coordinated and organized. So two things. One is that there is, cos there is cosmic harmony in the nature. That is Rita or that is pre-established harmony. The nature is disciplined. Similarly, the every aspect of human life is also disciplined. If any aspect is in discipline, then the entire human personality will be disintegrated, will be indisciplined. If any individual will remain indisciplined, entire society will be disintegrated. Therefore, the criminals are sent to jail. Human beings are jealous. Human beings are jealous. There is no religious There is no law in this situation. There is no law in this situation. This is the same. This is the same. This are the same. This is the same. This
Thank you.